very sensitive mind. Actually, I think it would be better if they do come out together. Perhaps from here, yes, yeah. come out here. Anybody reading prayers? Soon. You're very welcome to wherever you are. So, this is an interfaith event looking at the way in which the teachings of peace and non violence in each faith's sacred writings can build bridges between us. Organisers feel that, particularly in the shadow of recent events in Afghanistan, this is an essential thing to look at at this time and pray about. So, we're going to have some opening prayers and a few housekeeping rules and then input from our keynote speakers who will speak in turn and i'll introduce them in turn so for now you're very welcome and we'll have our prayers now just a few just a few notes um, we, we do encourage people to wear masks if they are able to and if they're willing. And if you're both able and willing but have left yours at home, there are some spare there. But we're not going to turf anybody out if they don't. But if you could maintain the sort of distancing, those distancing. And the reason I asked, we asked for your contact details for those we haven't got already is really as part of the COVID regulations so that should one of us become ill in the next week, we can contact you and you'll have to isolate, won't you? Um, and so thank you very much for that. Um, when you came in, you were given as well as a sort of timetable and some information. You were also given a black piece of paper. Or you can always get one later. Now that really is for your questions. So after the while the main speakers are speaking, any particular question you'd like them to address when we come to the panel discussion. There's a red box on the table over there. Will you pop it in that red box during the lunch break? Third and final message, lunch break for those, those speakers and people we've told that we have ordered sandwiches, we've got them here. Um, people who've brought their sandwiches or whatever, that's fine. People who've neither had sandwiches ordered, nor have brought any. If you go out of the um, meeting house, turn left and just round the corner in Little Clarendon Street, there are one or two cafes. We ordered sandwiches from the tree, um, what's it called, tree artisan cafe. Um, they're very nice. But there are one or two others as well. But please be back promptly for the afternoon session. And I shall now hand over. We will have prayers. Thank you. And the prayers you will find in your week of prayer for world peace. Um, one. So, so, so I'm not reading one. But, uh, the first prayer is by Rabbi Harold Kushner. Let the rain come and wash away the ancient grudges, the bitter hatreds held and nurtured over generations. Let the rain wash away the memory of the hurt, the neglect. Then let the sun come out and fill the sky with rainbows. Let the warmth of the sun Heal us wherever we are broken. Let it burn away the fog 
so that we can see each other clearly. So that we can see beyond labels, beyond accents, gender or skin colour. Let the warmth and brightness of the sun melt our selfishness. So that we can share the joys and feel the sorrows of our neighbours. Somebody else has been asked to read it, and my apologies if so. Put it down to my age and short-term memory loss. Bless you with God's grace, and may the power of prayer bring peace to the earth. This is the time when sincerely and honestly we should all pray to God so that there may be peace on the earth again. Well, it's, um... Give us, Lord God, a vision of our world as your love will make lecture. it. She was a a world where the weak and unprotected and she and I worked on go hungry or poor. She died. I mean, it was a world where the benefits of civilised life are shared and everyone can enjoy them. A world where different races, nations and cultures live in mutual respect. I mean, but it's about Rebuilding stuff on the but it, it's at the and base of the And give us the inspiration on. and courage to build it. And it's on from Thank you. 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 Okay, we're going to immediately move on to inputs from four very distinguished speakers. And they're going to have 10, 15 minutes each, uh, one following the other. And there'll be questions after lunch. So, as Patricia said, could you please um, write any questions out? And for those on Zoom, I believe you can do it on the chat. So, without more ado, our first speaker is Dr. Maria Power speaking for Christianity. Dr. Maria is a fellow of Blackfriars Hall, which is just up the road, where she's a senior research fellow in human dignity at the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice, and a visiting fellow at, at the Benedict XVI Centre for Religion and Society at St. Mary's. She is the book reviews editor for the Journal for the Study of the Bible and Violence. Her academic research focuses on the role that religions can play in ameliorating violence and ethnic conflict, and much recent work has been based on Northern Ireland. Her research on conflict and peace seeks to understand how religious organisations should behave in conflict and post-conflict situations in order to have a positive impact. So we very much look forward to hearing you, Maria. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, no. Do you want me to hold that to one? Yeah, hi. Um, so today 
I'm, I'm going to speak as a Catholic Christian um, who researches on um, peace building in specific contexts. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that Christian teachings on violence and peace reflect the lived reality of faith and in particular the pressures that Christians face in trying to reconcile scripture and tradition, if you're Catholic, with the demands of living in and encountering the modern world. Consequently, teachings on violence and peace are full of tensions regarding understandings of the nature and meaning of the Christian vocation. Christian teaching on violence and peace now focuses on dealing with the causes of violence and that the responsibility to protect, which we see in just war theory, can and should be achieved by creating a social order based upon the teachings of Christ rather than a recourse to arms. This has been termed by Christian social ethicists such as Ben Stazen and um, increasingly Pope Francis as just peace. So in 1965, the Catholic Church stated that peace is not merely the absence of war, nor can it be reduced solely to the maintenance and balance of power between enemies. Um, um, nor, um, nor is it brought, brought by dictatorship. Instead, it is rightly and appropriately called an enterprise of justice. Peace results from that order structured into human society by its divine founder and actualized by men and women as they thirst after ever greater justice. So in this, uh, the teachings of the Catholic Church joined a growing chorus within Christianity, demanding that Christians seek to free society of war and violence by working for justice and creating that more perfect society. In doing so, it moved the focus of uh, teachings from just war um, and its containment of violent conflict to a focus on eradicating the structural violence um, that was the cause of war. So issues like material poverty, racism, um, and oppressive political structures. So structural violence is what prevents human flourishing and stops the achievement of the common good from being the goal in political, economic, and social decision-making. It's essentially a form of evil. The form of peace, then, that we need to achieve can only be created through a credible reenactment of the kingdom of God. This is because through his incarnation, Christ modelled the form of societal perfection that is required for justice and peace to flourish, an example which, through our baptism as Christians, we are compelled to follow. Thus, as well as improving the material conditions of the, of the oppressed and the poor, we must enter into a Christ-centred relationship with them. We must work with them rather than for them. Through such a process, we are expected to create a common vision for the future of humanity that is granted in scripture. A vision of society in which the causes of war, conflict and violence no longer exist, and the common good and human flourishing of the norm are the norm. This involves building a community where we can live truly human lives, free from discrimination on account of race, religion or nationality, free from servitude to others or to natural forces which we cannot yet satisfactorily control. It involves building a human community where liberty is not an idle word, where the needy Lazarus can sit down with the rich man at the same banquet table. In doing so, we are committing ourselves to the ceaseless pursuit of the just ordering of human affairs. This inbreaking of the kingdom into history requires ongoing work, and um, it's not something I think we'll ever see, but we need to be working for it anyway. It is the complete example of the already but not yet, the meaning of which is perfectly summed up by Gustavo Guterres, who said, the kingdom is the final meaning in history, its total fulfillment takes place beyond history and at the same time is present from the moment from this moment on. But while some um, Christian realists would regard these hopes as vain flights of fancy, such adversity when endured for the sake of one's brothers and sisters and out of love for them can contribute greatly to human progress. This concept of just peace is taught through Christian social ethics 
which indicates the different steps that Christians can take to create a new social order. These teachings are produced through a prayerful reading and interpretation of the scripture to create a new moral vision for society. This moral vision is born from the combination of three elements. The Gospel and the Magisterium, um, is, the Magisterium is, is Catholic social teaching effectively, um, empirical analysis and most crucially dialogue. Through the, uh, through the use of such a method, the already but not yet emerges for each particular milieu, enabling the binary goals of the church for individuals of personal and communal uh, salvation to be achieved. How am I doing for time? At least five minutes. Okay, great. Um, so at this point, it might be useful to outline Catholic teachings on a particular topic um, so we can see how it works. In 1967, Pope Paul VI told us that development is the new name for peace. In doing so, he showed that the employment of the techniques of development was key to the eradication of structural justice and was the root, one of the roots, to justice and peace. Indeed, the development was so key to Catholic teachings of peace that Paul VI created the Pontifical Commission on Justice and Peace in 67 to ensure that human dignity and flourishing in the global south remained the key focus of our attention. However, the form of development espoused by the Catholic Church um, focuses on empowerment and equality rather than upon dependency, which is, I think, what we see governments trying to do. Since the papacy of John XXIII, CST has underscored the fundamental need to build a more just global economic system and has been critical of policies that hurt the poor and marginalised. The overarching arching argument behind this teaching is that every person should be allowed to live in a manner that recognises his or her dignity and which allows them to flourish and become the person that God intended them to be. The massive inequalities between countries in the global north and south must therefore be addressed in a ma manner which allows less economically robust countries to retain their autonomy. The teachings on the causes of global inequality have been consistent. The economic system, with its focus on profit margins and creation of a civilization of consumerism and waste, have led to the subordination of the human person to a world where a profit-based economic model dominates. Through this, human beings are no longer allowed to be active subjects in their own lives and their dignity is thereby violated a situation which is the embodiment of structural violence. This criticism of economic structures, be they capitalist, socialist or communist, has been cons a, a consistent feature of Christian social ethics um, throughout the last century. But how can this vision of, or teaching be translated into reality? For a just peace to emerge, human society needs to bear the closest possible resemblance to the kingdom of God outlined in the Sermon on the Mount and demonstrated by Jesus' actions throughout his ministry. The entire people of God proclaim, need to proclaim the message of the gospel. Therefore, we as Christians are expected to work to bring about the constructive change needed to er eradicate the structural violence that is preventing human flourishing and the common good from emerging. This is because just peace can be a historical reality, something that Christians can work to bring about, as well as an offer of hope to believers. Sadly, although the gospel and Christian social ethics demand that Christians work to build a new social order, they do not offer us a programme or blueprint for action. This is achieved by a further reading of what John the Twenty-Third called the signs of the times, which allows the teachings of the gospel to be translated into any given context, and this always has to come from a grassroots perspective. The starting point should be the belief that the world is not as it should be. This was one of the main reasons for the incarnation and subsequent kenosis of Christ. Christians are therefore taught that they must use the ideals raised by the gospels to engage in critical and ethical reflection upon the social order. But because of the position taken by Jesus in the Gospels towards the poor and marginalised, 
there is little room for impartiality. Consequently, this means that the lived realities of the poorest members of our society have to be understood if we are going to work to challenge the structural violence that leads to war and conflict and allows people to think it's okay to buy nuclear weapons rather than pay for hospital beds. Once this consciousness raising is completed, a new moral vision which shows what a just social order would look like must be developed and a method for achieving it decided upon. Then the work of building a just peace begins. So to conclude, I'm not suggesting that any of this will be easy or that we will ever see the results. In fact, some of the people um, I work with in Northern Ireland talk about a program of succession planning to ensure that their work is never undone. But as the world faces crisis after crisis, the words of, the words of an evangelical street pastor in East Belfast I met recently act as a clarion call to me. Peace building and reaching out across divides should be the expression of the life of the church. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, that talk would have been very familiar to Barbara Eggleston, who I should have mentioned at the beginning. So this um, day is in honour of Barbara, who died about 17 years ago. And she was the first chair of Christian CND, and many people here knew her very well. So thank you very much. That was wonderful, Maria. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Kamele Taha, representing Islam. And he hasn't had to come too far now. He's here at Oxford University. So Kamele is currently based at the Oxford Prospects Institute as a lecturer in cancer immunology. And I might say he's done considerable work on health in relation to coronavirus. I was reading up last night and it's just fantastic. He has been an Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at King Saud University in Saudi Arabia and an Associate Professor of Immunology at the National University of Malaya in Malaysia. His interest in Islamic teachings and the Holy Quran goes back to his childhood years in Algeria. Kamel memorized the Holy Quran at the age of 17 and studied the basics of Islamic tenets. He has contributed to the translation of a number of religious manuscripts from Arabic to English. And he is the current Muslim chaplain to Imam Manawar Hussein, the High Sheriff of Oxford. So we're very honored to have you here with us today. We look forward to hearing you. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, it gives me great pleasure to be with you today, with this wonderful gathering, with these beautiful people. Our meeting today is blessed. It is blessed because we are together. It is blessed because we are here for no purpose other than advancing in the path of getting to know each other better, to reach out to each other, to understand each other more, to learn from each other and to enrich each other. And all this for the overall purpose of leading a life that is in harmony with the divine with our surroundings and with our other, other fellow human beings. Building bridges among the various communities can be quite challenging, although this is not the topic or the subject of our gathering today. 
uh, I thought of giving this introduction because I feel it is vital to start off with this. It has always been challenging throughout the history of humankind and it is more so in these modern times where various elements may contribute to making it even harder for communities to come together. The tremendous pressures of the modern way of, the modern way of life, the waning of the spiritual dimensions in the education system or systems and in society in general, the priority given to the material over the spiritual in our everyday life is unfortunately so blatant. However, I believe the mercy of the Almighty is always there. It is there always and it is there for a purpose and it is there as an instrument for a balance. The ease of communication, access to information made easy by technology and ease, for ease of travel could be an amazing tool through which our coming together is made easier and thus Can With regards to the topic today of peace, etymologically speaking, the word Islam, from the perspective of the Islamic scripture, the word Islam means peace and submission. Muslims greet each other by saying, Assalamu alaikum, meaning peace be upon you. Like the majority of the followers of other faiths, the majority of Muslims believe in seeking a just and peaceful world. The Muslim prayer starts with thanking the Almighty God for his blessings and ends with greeting of peace. Peace to the surrounding, peace to society we live in, peace to all humanity. Throughout the sacred text, the Qur'an, the word peace is often found in relation to various aspects and topics. To illustrate, greetings of peace on the prophets, peace be on all of them, in chapter 37, relating their stories and ending each story by stating, Peace be open so and so. Peace be open Noah, Elijah, Abraham, Isaac, Ismael, Moses and Haran, Jonas and John, and Jesus and his blessed Virgin Mother Mary. Blessings and peace be open all. The Holy Quran also stresses the importance of recognizing the vital need for a society to live in peace and security, and the need for this society to be grateful for the blessings of these elements. The Quraysh, the Meccan tribe in Arabia, where the Prophet of Islam was born in, were blessed by such status among all the Arabs as the custodians of the holy sanctuary, the Kaaba built by the prophet Abraham and as a recipient of his as recipient of his tradition the Quran reminds them of this chapter 106 verses 14 for the security of Quraysh their security during winter and summer journeys let them worship the lord of this house who has fed them against hunger and has secured them against fear. At the social level, greetings of peace among the adherents to the faith or other faiths is emphasized. Chapter 2, the Quran says, and do not allow your oaths in God's name to hinder you from virtue. 
and righteousness, and making peace between people. God is listener and knower. Another verse highlights the importance of peace between members of community. God guides with whoever God guides whoever follows his approval to the ways of peace, and he brings them out of darkness into light. Another verse also highlights, follows in the same uh, point, that the servants of the merciful are those who walk the earth in humility, and when the ignorant address them, they say, peace. Finally, there are so many verses in the Quran. I, I, I looked at the number of verses that highlight the peace. There are more than 250 verses where the word peace is highlighted in the Quran. When entering someone else's home, فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُ بُيُوتًا فَسَلِّمْ in Arabic sayings. Spreading peace even when you enter someone's home the custom is to say assalamu alaikum that's the greeting spreading peace within a society starts with the greetings the importance of the word here is not to be overlooked the prophet of islam through his life his teaching his engagement with the various religious communities was the best illustration of the quranic injunctions when the Prophet moved to the city of Medina, he signed the Treaty of Medina with the Jewish community, who lived side by side with the Arabs. The Treaty of Medina clearly stated the importance of recognizing each other, living with each other in harmony, helping each other, and more importantly, living in peace with each other. Differences in religious beliefs should never represent an impediment. The Treaty of Medina recognized that the Jewish community and the newly established Muslim community are what we say in Arabic, Ummatun Wahida, one community, one nation that is, bound by rights, responsibilities, and common goals. In his first sermon at the mosque in Medina, the Prophet of Islam tells his followers, spread peace, afshu salam, feed the poor and the needy, care for your kinship, and pray when people are asleep. You will enter paradise in peace. He also tells them, you will not attain salvation till you believe and you will not believe till you love each other, and you won't love each other till you spread peace among you. In any society, peace, however, needs to be aligned with justice, protect, protected by justice, preserved by justice. For peace to be sustained, justice needs to prevail in societies, the Quran puts central importance on justice in order to have in a functional, harmonious and thriving society. Without justice, we cannot create peace. History teaches us that societies, nations, civilizations that flourished were able to do so when the members of that society were treated fairly and justly. And thus, the importance of this in the sacred text is highly emphasized. Afghanistan, which is uh, why we are gathered here, is to, to discuss what unfortunately has been happening, sadly, the, event, the, 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 the events of the last few months, is a country rich in history and with great tradition of culture and learning, represent a very good example of Unfortunately, a waste opportunity. The situation in Afghanistan is very complex. One element that played at the detriment of the aspiration of the people of Afghanistan 
is undoubtedly the politics, local politics, as well as foreign interventions. However, there is a way forward. I believe the people of Afghanistan have the capacity to get out of this by drawing in their very rich cultural and religious experiences to reach a sustainable peace within their country and within the region. In conclusion, peace in society is a need, not a luxury. In the Holy Quran, and as in the previous text, sacred texts, the importance of peace within a community and between communities is paramount. To achieve peace and harmony, communities are encouraged to reach out to each other, learn from each other, and enrich each other. Quran says, all you human beings we have created you from one male and one female, so that you know each other. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. And I think we can immediately see the echoes between different effects. Um, I'm struck by no, no peace without justice. That's very strong thinking of justice and peace in the Catholic Church. Thank you so much. Okay, amidst all the richness now, we have our third speaker, BJ Nater, who'd like to come to the mic. BJ is a peace activist and author, and is chair of Uniting for Peace. His notable books include The Economics of Killing, Peace Beyond Borders, and How Not to Go to War. One of his books carried a forward by Nelson Mandela, no less, and others have been lauded by Nobel Peace Laureates Jose Ramos Horta of Timor Leste and Mairead Corrigan Maguire. And in fact, BJ has kindly already given me one of his books, which are on the back there, and on the front is an endorsement from the Dalai Lama. I heard you speak quite... two years ago, actually, yes. in London, yes. and I was so impressed. Um, it was a London symposium on the United Nations, Great Powers and World Peace, and your faith in the United Nations impressed me very much then. So we very much look forward to hearing you now you. representing Hinduism. Thank you, Aline and Agar. I, I try to... I try to keep up in your height. <laughs> okay, uh, distinguished chair, speakers, respected audience, some of you I can see and I have worked with them for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years before, especially people in the Christian campaign for nuclear disarmament. And thanks for hosting this event because I know I host events for United for Peace. And it takes me two or three months to organize an event. So, so I know how much work you have put it into it. Thanks, thanks very much. So before I start my talk, I've got some housekeeping. There is test your knowledge for peace. Please fill it up and at lunchtime I will be at the, my table over there and we can see if your answers are correct, and if not, we'll tell you the right answers. And second housekeeping, I've got about 10 books today. They are 10 pounds, but today special price for CCND, five pounds. Okay, that's the, I think, the finish of the commercial. And in my talk today, I'm going to explore how faiths in general and Hinduism in particular, can promote peace, non-violence, and work in cooperation for a better world. In short, how can we have a strategy between hostile communities and faith traditions for building peace, conflict prevention, dialogue, and diplomacy? I will also be talking about Afghanistan, violence in religion, Hinduism and nuclear weapons, which 
CCLD does a lot of work, and also core beliefs of Hinduism and how faith religious communities can work together for building a non-violent peaceful world. Dear friends, according to the National Priorities Project 2021, the financial cost of 20-year 20, 20 conflict in Afghanistan, foreign and domestic militarization, surveillance, repression and other conflicts post 9-11 runs into 21 trillion US dollars. Just imagine what we can do with that money, from which Afghani people are suffering. <clears throat> And after the withdrawal of the UK and US troops from Afghanistan, things are so dire. And US, UN has reported there could the food will run out this month, and there are consequent consequences of are dire for Afghani people facing a great looming humanitarian disaster. So 20 years of war, continued drone strikes and escalating violence have left people of Afghanistan to face an upcoming famine. And they're not responsible for it. US and UK and the allies are responsible. And they have got nothing to offer. There's no justice, no accountability, nothing to offer in return to push Afghanistan to the which they have pushed Afghanistan to the brink of economic collapse and bankruptcy. Okay, we are dealing with Taliban, but this is not the old Taliban who were very violent. We need to trust and reassure them and release the locked funds and the economic sanctions which are crippling Afghani people. And we need to stop this humanitarian disaster unfolding. Dear friends, in a book which I read recently, War and Peace in Islam, the and uses and abuses of jihad, chapter 7, gives the mass killings or the body counts of the last 2000 years about all the religions. In the, and and it lists around 3,000 violent conflicts. And there is a table in chapter 7 which gives which responsible are, which religion is responsible for more mass killings in the history for the last 2,000 years. And the table is like this. Christianity war killing on a mass scale, 178 million. Atheists mass killing, 124 million. See, Sacred, I don't know how, is, how to say it, but it's a civilization which includes legalism, Taoism, and Confucian, Confucianism. In China, and the killing are 117 million. Buddhists, would you, you wouldn't believe it, it's a non violent religion. Buddhists, mass killing 105 million. Islam killings are 31 million only. Only not, I'm saying even one person killed is too, too, much, too many. But what I'm saying is to the, all the mass propaganda of the people all over the world about Muslim religion and this and that is, is pathetic. And Hinduism killings are 2.93 million. So according to this table, the most peaceful religions are Sikhism, Taoism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. However, one of the most pressing, according to the media, contemporary issue threatening peace in Europe, Middle East, and elsewhere. Can, can we have a drop of water, please? My throat is already drying. <laughs> uh, is violence, extremism, and Islamophobia. <coughs> and it's also, it's naive to think that it's possible to overcome Islamophobia, terrorism, by military means. Thank you, Eddie.
Dear friends, religion or faith is an instrument of inner transformation of human beings so they can be they can behave ethically in a non-violent way towards all living beings. A religion that enslaves, tortures and kills is no religion at all. It is travesty or monstrosity in the guise of spiritual path. In our times, we have observed this phenomenon in the way in which violent few have perverted and deformed the beautiful and venerable religion of Islam. But we have seen it happening before to other faiths as well. So our goal of peace fuels an ardent desire for dialogue about the issues around the violent conflict. A non-negotiable condition for this is dialogue. However, for that, violence needs to stop. So we people require immediate action, immediately. We look back with horror to, the, to contemplate, contemplate tragedies like the Rwandan genocide, like the Armenian genocide, like the Jewish Holocaust, and wonder how could this happen? Why didn't anyone do anything to prevent it? And, and we all know all tragedies emerge from the seeds of hatred and prejudice leading to violence and killing. Let me move on to, this was all sidetracking, Hinduism and first of all nuclear weapons because this is quite relevant because Christian campaign for nuclear disarmament does a lot of work. India and its neighbor Pakistan has around 100 to 120 nuclear warheads and when tensions flare up between the two neighbors, it can, it can become a very threatening scenario that could destroy the whole world. That's why it's so urgent and important to work for the abolition of nuclear weapons because the slightest human or technical error can finish the planet. And religion, that's what we are talking today, should be the first to raise its voice in a united way for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And we also need to bust the myth and propaganda of the military lobby and the complicity of media along with it, because most of the media is owned by the rich, uh, uh, rich people, relentlessly carrying on the propaganda that it is only military strength and nuclear weapons that are effective deterrent that keep uh, peace in the world. Let me move on to Hinduism, because that's what I was supposed to speak and I sidetracked myself. Core beliefs of Hinduism are peace, non-violence, love, compassion, unity and Vasudev become, which in English is world is one family. So Hinduism's vision for building a non-violent is a non-violent peaceful world. In the Hindu religion, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, Shiv the destroyer exists simultaneously. Actually there are more than 365 gods in Hindu religion. <coughs> One, one, even more than one for each day. But these three are the biggest ones. They simultaneously represent the multiplicity of God. The mystic experience of Hinduism is a sense of oneness or unity with all beings, whether that is described as God, nature and real. Hindu teachers have always made it clear there is only one spiritual reality, Brahman, the one reality which is the principle of all beings. Brahman is described in the Vedas as being, consciousness and bliss, which is Sat, Chit and Anand. 
Dear friends, India is a nation of 1.4 billion people with 1 billion Hindus, close or even more to 200 million Muslims, 25 million Christians, <clears throat> 20 million Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Baha'is, Jews and others. A diverse world setting along with this secular constitution. Plural society witnessing pressures from all and threats from everywhere. More than 500 million people are illiterate and live in absolute poverty and more than 600 million lack basic sanitation and 200 million lack safe drinking water. Dear friends, India is, is one of the only cultures influenced by four major leading religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam and Christianity. In that respect, its history is unparalleled. What other people can claim the likes of Gautam Buddha? Mahavir, Vivekanand, Shri Ram Krishna, Shankaracharya, and Mahatma Gandhi. The Saint Ram Krishna often described different religious experiences as different maladies of music. The Rig Veda, which is considered to be the oldest book, book on earth, have described the reality of the world as, as Truth is one, paths are many, reality is one, sages call it by various names. So interfaith meetings like today are so important because they increase the understanding of different faiths and, and, and increase the uh, necessity of cooperation for peace and social justice and common good of humanity. Because ultimate goal of all religions or Hindus refer to spiritual peace, spiritual peace or peace in society and nature. It is through unity and giving up one's separateness that universal peace can be obtained. Traditionally, Hinduism has adopted an ancient Sanskrit phrase, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, as the world is one family. The, the essence of this concept is observation that only base minds have got divisions or, or dictatomies. The more we seek wisdom, the more we become inclusive and free of internal spirit from worldly illusions. World peace is hence only achieved through internal beings by liberating ourselves from artificial boundaries that separate us all which means inner peace. So inner peace comes from within and is futile to seek it elsewhere. It radiates from within and our behavior will be its own manifestation. What you see towards people is a reflection of who you are and what you feel. Let me say one of our ancient emperors, Emperor Ashok, yeah, we've got a, the lights to fit for the 15th of December. Ooh, when were Francis Halliday has had an accident, someone back there calling for that. Exceptional doctrine of life in which subject is all I'll just sort of sell it at that. I'll tell her about, about the taxi tour. He was one of the first emperors to put the doctrine of non-violence into practice to the extent that even deer hunting was banned by him in his kingdom. <coughs> the teachings of Guru, Guru Nanak, the Sikh leader, founder of Sikhism, promoted that there is no Hindu or Muslim. All beings are creatures of his, which means gods. He, God, belongs to all. That is one of the chapters in the Guru Granth Sahib. Hindus believe that life is a series of beginnings and not endings. Creation is an ongoing process. And when we aim to create a perfect world where love and compassion are shared by all suffering to see is the ultimate goal of Hinduism. 
And today's meeting is very important because faith, religion is essential, essential to bring unity and compassion in everyday life. <coughs> Each and everyone, whoever they may be, Jew, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, without reservation or exception, brothers and sisters in all, as, as St. Francis saw it. In 2009, I wrote a book, How Not to Go to War, <clears throat> which I proposed, in which I proposed that every country should have a department of, or a ministry of, for peace at governmental level <clears throat> and also appoint a minister for peace and disarmament which we have actually in the labor, uh, a shadow week peace and disarmament minister we have at, the, at, at present, uh, David Hamilton MP. It will create infrastructures for peace and the peace department will, will promote a culture of non-violence at home and abroad by seeking common ground through dialogue, diplomacy, negotiations and alternatives to war. Book also advocates opening peace centers like ashrams in India to act as training community and educational hubs for peace builders and community leaders hosting like today interfaith meetings, dialogue, <clears throat> multicultural activities and seminars on reducing violence, knife crime, shooting and murders. And it will be Indians for cultural transformation and promoting culture of peace. I'm going, to finish. I'm going to finish soon. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go straight to my conclusion. If anybody wants this long speech, they can ask for it, because it is on my computer. Let me say, dear friends, that civilization in the long run can only prevail if society is based on moral and ethical values and standards. We can all hear and in our faiths make a huge difference for us and future generations. What is hope? Hope is all about determination and believing that our and your actions is going to make things a little bit better. So let's do it, let's start the work now today. To follow the line of Hinduism vision to build a non-violent, peaceful world, should, we should invoke the strength of Burma, the creator, Vishnu the preserver, preserver, and pray for the powers of Shiv the destroyer to remain dormant. In a sense, the message of Hindu religion is to work for building a peaceful world. Dear friends, in conclusion, let me say that dreams never get fulfilled, commitments do. Changes must be transformative. They require bold vision and courage. It is protest and activism which brings change and always have. The publication of my book, How Not to Go to War, and establishing Department for Peace and Peace Centers Worldwide are steps in the right direction, which will spread non-violence and culture of peace. This will ultimately put an end to a culture of militarism violence, war, and build a non-violent, peaceful world. This is an aspiration for it, which I am willing to devote the rest of my life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Words of wisdom. And our final speaker is Rosling for representing Buddhism. Roslyn has been active with Servas, an international hosting and travelling organisation, originally founded after the Second World War to promote peace through international friendship. Ross is a member of Soke Gakkai International, a global community-based Buddhist organisation accredited to the United Nations and strongly anti-nuclear. She is also a CMD council member. So you're very welcome. We look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I also want to mention the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Who Yay. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're all, <laughs> all partners with ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Is that working? Hello? Oh. 
Can you hear me okay? Yeah, could you tell us your name again? My name is Rosalind Cook. Rosalind Cook, yeah. Is that better? Yes. Um, thank you. I'm very honoured to be invited to speak with this distinguished panel and to be with you today for our such an honourable cause and to learn a little bit also about Barbara. So um, that's an uh, additional honour as somebody who's been working over 16 years to abolish and eliminate nuclear weapons. And um, specifically to talk about my faith, which has enabled me to keep going doing that. Um, and it is a Buddhist faith. I'm aware that it might be confusing that there are, the Buddha taught 80, over 80,000 teachings and there are many different types of Buddhist practice. So I will start by specifying the basis of our practice. Sokka Gakkai um, stands for um, a value creating society. And it was founded on the 18th of November 1930 by an educator called Mr. Makaguchi, who I recognized in the teachings of an Nichiren Daishonin, um, who was a um, priest actually dedicated in the 13th century in Japan to find through the sutras the um, Finding the sutras the answer to, to resolve the, the problem of suffering and to bring about a peaceful world, ultimately. And he discovered that the Lotus Sutra, um, the supremacy of the Lotus Sutra was important because of the time. It was always important that the Buddha taught according to the time and the capacity of the people. And um, so it came about in 1253 that um, he, he, was, he found in the Lotus Sutra the, the fact that it was very important in the latter day of the law, which had just started, was predicted around that time that somebody would emerge to reveal the practice for all people to be able to access their Buddha nature, that all people equally have Buddha nature. Even women can attain enlightenment, which for 13th century Japan was going to be quite radical. Um, but I will, I will divide my talk into to three parts, probably, thinking about how to approach this. Um, I'll start by looking at one of the main teachings that Nichiren Daishonin presented to the governing authorities of Japan in 1260. Well, can I put it, on the, put it on the table and see if it still picks you up loud enough, because it's coming to get you too Too loud. Oh, is that better? That's OK, yeah. Okay. So. Sorry. Thank you. Well, that's fine. Um, so the, the teaching uh, Nichiren Daishonin presented to the governing authorities of Japan in 1260 was called the correct teaching for the peace of the land. So I'll talk a bit about that and then I will go into some of the key principles that are so relevant to peace and um, establishing a peaceful world um, in Buddhism. And then I will come to the, the writings of President Daisaku Keida, who is based in Japan, in Tokyo. He's now 93. And he has been president of the Soka Gakkai since 1960. Um, following his mentor, President Toda, who came out of prison in 1945 in Japan, um, there were, at that time, nobody <laughs> practicing. So we now have over 12 million people in 192 countries and territories. Thanks very much to the, to the earnest efforts of President Toda and President Ikeda. So um, I'll start then to go back to the, um, the treaties that I was talking about. Yeah, put it into context. 13th century Japan was a time of great calamities and natural disasters. And there was a great deal of lamenting. There was a lot of epidemic, there were a lot of natural disasters. So in the tree times, there was a warning against the slander of the law, the law being the need to respect the dignity of all life. 
and the Trin saw the cause of the calamities befalling the people as being this failure to respect the dignity of all life, leading to all these multiple crises and extreme suffering. And the Trin was pointing to the way the people were being confused and true teachings had been distorted. So he urged authorities that a return to the original purpose of Buddhism, securing the peace and happiness of the people, was vital in redirecting the course of society. So I find it is easy to see here the modern day equivalents, the destruction of our environment, the human rights abuses, the existence of nuclear weapons, in particular, deny that all life has within it the Buddha nature and is worthy of respect, and that it is vital to speak out against such slander. As Nitrin said in his treatise, rather than offering up 10,000 prayers for remedy, it would be better simply to outlaw this one evil. If the nation is destroyed and people's homes are wiped out, then where can one flee for safety? If you care anything about your personal security, you should first of all pray for order and tranquility throughout the four quarters of the land, should you not? And he concludes, you must quickly reform the tenets that you hold in your heart and embrace the one true vehicle, the single good doctrine of the Lotus If you do so, then three time. But also, um, in the Lotus Sutra, there is the example of the character Bodhisattva never disparaging, who is the epitome of um, the reason that it is believed Chakimuni arrived in this world, which is to, to demonstrate the way to behave in order to respect the dignity of all life. So Bodhisattva, never disparaging, would respond to all who confront him, however adversely, that he reveres the Buddha nature within them. So in the practice, we are thus also encouraged to expand our spheres of compassion. More of that later. Okay, I'm going to now look at some of those Buddhist principles which are especially relevant to establishing peace and climate justice, which I've also been recently involved with campaigning for. And they also illustrate what lay behind Nitrin's appeal to the authorities of his day. So there's the principle of Esho Funi, which is the oneness of self and environment, two but not two. So our state of life affects the environment and vice versa. And as I've heard here already today, it is therefore a reality that the transformation of our inner state of life and that of in each individual brings about the transformation of the outer world and society. And the condition of the world reflects the life state of many of its inhabitants was an observation made by Nitrin. So there's also a concept you may have heard of a dependent origination, which is the fact that we are everything, everyone, interconnected. And I think we've been reminded of that particularly by the multiple crisis facing us now, that we obviously need global solutions for all of humanity to have security, real human security. So I'm excited by the vision that is possible with, a, with the belief that it is possible for a collective transformation, which I believe we may be in the middle of. In Buddhism, the three poisons of greed, anger and foolishness have been identified, leading Greed leading to natural disaster, inflation and food shortages. Anger leading to warfare and strife. And foolishness leading to disease when pestilence <coughs> breaks out and mental and physical illness is apparent. And through this practice, we know that we, all of us, can transform poison into medicine. Lotus Sutra is referred to as medicine and the visual of this is a lotus flower that is possible to bloom in the muddy pond. So this principle is best described by one of these quotes I'm going to read now. 
If the minds of living beings are impure, their land is also impure. But if their minds are pure, so is their land. There are not two lands, pure or impure, in themselves. The difference lies solely in the good or evil of our minds. It is the same with the Buddha and an ordinary being. When deluded, one is called an ordinary being, but when enlightened, one is called a Buddha. This is similar to a tarnished mirror that will shine like a jewel when polished. A mind now clouded by the illusions of the innate darkness of life is like a tarnished mirror. But when polished, it is sure to become like a clear mirror reflecting the essential nature of phenomena and the true aspect of reality. Arouse deep faith and diligently polish your mirror day and night. How should you polish it? Only by chanting Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. <clears throat> so Nam Yoho Renge Kyo is in fact um, the title of the Lotus Sutra and contains within it its entirety. It can also be translated as in dedication to the mystic law of simultaneous cause and effect. The Lotus Sutra reveals not only that all people have Buddhahood, that we have this potential to change our karma in, this, in our present form, in this lifetime. So the Lotus Sutra sees and blossoms at the same time. This is how instantly we can transform um, fundamental darkness into enlightenment. Every single moment gives us an opportunity to create value, in other words, and this is where we find great hope. Such a transformation at this time, I found, is related to the deep change of narrative we are being called to integrate in terms of our relationship with nature and all beings. So I've long been an advocate for international law against ecocide, making the destruction of the environment a crime at the International Criminal Court. This idea is gathering momentum globally in recognition of the shift in mindset that needs to be backed up legally. So this is just to show how this Buddhist principle um, I found relevant to, to what I'm doing. Um, as well as the abolition of nuclear weapons, which was called for by the second president in 1957 with a very strong declaration that all nuclear weapons must be abolished. The second Buddhist principle I want to talk about is the inner transformation that we call human revolution. I've touched on it already. We access our Buddha nature through chanting and Myoharenge Kyo to draw out the courage, the compassion, wisdom and life force which are the characteristics of a Buddha. And we all have this in any given moment, however latent, and we can take action on the basis of this. Whatever has happened, we cannot change the past, but if we want to affect the future, we can look at the causes we are making now. It goes from now on, empowering, because we learn that it is up to us to shift all relationships, starting with having gratitude for the challenges and the adversity that allows us to grow. Learning to anticipate obstacles as inevitable. Depending, we learn how to, that depending on how we respond, they can be tools for our growth and fuel for the creation of value. By mastering our minds, we can develop a solid sense of self. The four virtues of eternity, true self, joy and purity can emerge as we access uh, the higher states of life. And as President Dasaku Ikeda has pointed out in this famous quotation, a great human revolution in just a single individual will help achieve a change in the destiny of a nation and further can even enable a change in the de destiny of all humankind. So the third principle I wanted to, to look at was that of equity and of unity. The fact that, um, I mean, there's no hierarchy as such in our practice, all equally have the potential to reveal Buddhahood. Um, and the unity that I've heard mentioned already is reflected in the principle of Itandoshin, which means many in body, one in mind. So we are all unique, but we can be of one mind, the same mind as Nichiren, to um, devote our lives and to work on our human revolution so that we can contribute to a peaceful and just world. 
So in the Lotus Sutra, the Bodhisattvas of the Earth emerged as the ones who had thoroughly forged their resolve to spread and carry out the practice of the Sutra in the troubled age of the latter day of the law. And they are described in the Sutra as being firm in their intent and thought with the power of great perseverance. So we, bring, we emerge to bring about the peace of the land based on this fact that life is eternal and we chose our mission in this lifetime to prove the power of the law. I find this is also very relevant to establishing intergenerational justice for future generations. The right to life and a healthy environment is one that is deeply pertinent for the struggles and the crises we're facing currently. One minute okay, I just want to get on then, please, to the peace proposal um, 2021, which um, every year Das Agricada has written peace proposals for the United Nations, and I've been inspired by them since 2005, taking action for the prohibition and abolition of nuclear weapons. So, in the first half of the uh, peace proposal, he talks about the importance of self love. If you regard your own life, precious and irreplaceable, then you should grasp the fact that each person must also feel that way, making this realisation the basis for how you conduct your life. You should resolve never to act in ways that will cause harm to others. As illustrated by this anecdote, the Buddhist perspective on human rights urges us not to extinguish or suppress our feelings of cherishing ourselves above all else. On the contrary, by extending and opening a lovely field for ourselves to love for others, we can re-break the tapestry of our lives, restoring the ways in which we connect to others and to society at large. And I'd like then in closing to read one of these quotes which comes um, to do with the um, great breakthrough of the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons, which entered into force in January 2020, uh, this past January is a benchmark treaty and a pivotal event ushering in a new era, an event spurring a paradigm shift in approaches to security, because the only form of security that will bring about authentic peace is one in which it is unacceptable to sacrifice the inhabitants of any country and the right to exist is guaranteed to all the world's people. Traditional national security approaches based on pursuing one's own security apart from the interests of other peoples and countries are clearly inadequate. Rather, the necessary approach is one of human security, in which countries look beyond their immediate interests to work together to reduce and eliminate the threats facing all people. As the preamble of the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons states, the sense of urgency to ensure the security of all humanity lies at the foundation of this treaty. Establishing a norm comprehensively banning nuclear weapons under international law, the treaty's primary purpose lies in protecting the right to live of all the people with whom we share this planet, regardless of whether the states in which they live are nuclear weapon states, nuclear dependent states, or non-nuclear weapon states, and in in ensuring the survival of generations to come. Okay, I'm sure that's over more than my time, so... <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the discussion this afternoon. I can say more of what I have to Thank you. Thank you so much, Ross. And I think reevaluating how we see security is a key issue of our time. And I recognise your little water bottle. You were in Glasgow, weren't you? Yeah. Yes, I've got some people here. Yeah. 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 We've given them. You might recognise that one too. I didn't recognise that, no. Okay. But I've, I've lost my mark, so I've got the black one that Steve's wearing. So, that um, embracing the environment and other species as part of our security is in Catholic terminology. It's one of the signs of our times, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. You've all been absolutely wonderful. And we're now going to resume at 2 o'clock. Okay, welcome back and welcome to those of you who are on Zoom. And thank you for your questions as well, which we will be putting up and trying to answer. For the moment, we have uh, questions uh, from the group that's been here, so we'll start with those. So, as I say, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, we were very vegetarian, which was very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not really vegetarian. Okay. Thank you to um, Patricia and Michael Pullum, who've arranged so much of today. 
including the lunch. Very grateful. Um, Kamal, I think the first question is really addressed to you. Islam is so patently a religion of peace, and yet the image in the media is of a violent religion. Um, how do you feel about that, and how do you feel that perception can be changed? And I know that question is directed to you, but those of us who work in the media, that should be directed to us as well. But how do you feel about this? Yes. Uh, thanks for the. Thank you very much for the person who put this question. Because when you speak to Muslims in general, they are bewildered. They, are, they, they don't understand how Islam can be turned into an evil. I think is one of the major issues, is trying to understand the sacred text and build uh, or come up with conclusions that are most of the time wrong. In another, maybe <clears throat> one aspect that I need to, to, to say is to be self-critical as well, because also uh, Muslims sometimes they misunderstand some of the Quranic texts and uh, if you are not well versed in the Arabic language you may make a mistake go into a translation of the Quran to whatever other language and drawing conclusions <clears throat> from those uh, verses can create problems. And we, we, we have to acknowledge as well that Muslims or some of the people who speak on Islam, unfortunately, they get it wrong. How Islam looks at uh, the, the, the concept of war in Islam, the concept, what, what is jihad, the word jihad. Lots of people talk about jihad. Uh, let's spread Islam through jihad. No, even historically we didn't have uh, except there are some circumstances of course mistakes political mistakes did happen in history but the driving the main driving elements of uh, in Islam was you, you, you don't have the right to go to war against someone who does not share your beliefs you can't <clears throat> it, it is clearly stated in the Quran it's a principle you only have the right to defend yourselves if you cannot, you see yourself that your survival is at stake. And that is a human need. I mean, that, that is shared by all, all, all humanity. So there are lots of concepts that needs to be looked at in the light of the Quranic uh, understanding or Quranic truth before we uh, before also we blame the others, I think we need to start from our side as well. Mm. That's my, my answer. Thank you very much. <coughs> Maria, you said quite rightly that peace building should be at the heart of the Christian faith and action, but is it? In your view, is it? And if not, how can it be made so? Thank you. Um, <coughs> At the moment, I don't think it is. 
I think um, at the moment, one of the big challenges facing the Christian churches are the culture wars that are going on between the Christian right and the Christian left. I'm sorry to use those those um, terminologies, but I can't think of a better one at the moment, um, where people seem to be sh shouting past each other and themselves uh, misinterpreting our own sacred texts and not understanding that we are meant to be a religion of peace. Um, I think that we are now moving into a stage, um, I think we're moving into a new stage of Christianity um, that's been brought about by prophetic leaders by Pope, like Pope Francis, um, who is building on the work of previous popes um, and um, really pushing for a message of peace and pushing for um, us to actually work for peace and alongside he's working in an, an interfaith and uh, uh, an inter kind of inter Christian way as well and really um, the, the church leaders of Christianity are showing us that we do need to move forward in dialogue with one another um, I think that things with Christian nationalists and the Christian right in particular and the way in which the Christian left is um, responding to it will come to a head pretty soon and I, I think in a way that will be quite a useful exercise for the church, church the Christian churches because it will I, 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 I'm loath to use the word force um, but it will force them into actually going through a peace building process of their own um, and this then will give them the skills that they need to kind of reach out across other barriers. Thank you very much. The next question could be addressed to everybody, but we'll, we'll start with Ross and Vijay. The word inner transformation was mentioned as a prerequisite for, for peace in the world. The question is, how can those who follow religions of the book apply it to everyday living today and politics today? And in those written texts, there are elements that we perhaps might not be happy with about the different sexes and equality, uh, material wealth, attitudes to peace. Um, and slavery is accepted in some of the texts. I mean, certainly in the Bible, there are, it depends what, what bit you're reading. You know, particularly the Old Testament and the New Testament might be differences in attitude. So how do we deal with that with our sacred texts? And, and, and also applying the teachings to today's world. Perhaps Ross, you like to start? Yes. Yeah. Start. Sorry, first of all, are we okay with this? We're trying not to spread our mic around. Well, somebody online said so they couldn't hear very well, so you're in all if you have to speak very loudly. All well, <coughs> very loudly. All right, I'll try with this one. I'm probably better this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, lovely question. Thank you very much. Um, our practice is all about daily life and actually living the practice. So creating value in every single moment is possible um, based on um, the transformation principle. So whatever state of life we're in, anger, hell, hunger, you know, there's 10, ten worlds, but I won't go into the whole complexity. It sounds complex, but within each of those worlds, there's Buddhahood, there is the compassion, the, cu the courage and the wisdom. We all have that. If we have a moment to, to go in, and there are different practices for inner transformation, I'm sure you know, meditation has become quite mainstream. It, you don't have to be like following a book at all. Um, it's a very personal, individual thing, but to find the tools to be able to transform um, the energy that's in that anger to be able to create value. That is the, the essence, really, of, um, of our practice. Well, yeah. I'll just concentrate on the inner PC. I, I believe the question was a mouthful. It was, it was many questions it was rolled one. into one. Hmm. So if the other speakers can deal with it, and I'll deal with the inner peace. Because I believe world peace is only can only be achieved through internal peace, by liberating ourselves from artificial boundaries that separate us 
like Hindu, Jains, Buddhist, Sikhism, we are it because we believe in a Brahman which is one spiritual reality from the Hindu perspective. The, the truth we believe from the Hinduism is through unselfish, open-minded thoughts and behavior which encourage people to act in and live, act and live in harmony. Because one of the root causes of violence is lack of inner peace. So in, in our Vedic texts, there are five obstacles to inner peace. What are they? Which are in all the scriptures, Bhagavad Gita, Vedic culture, even in Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism and Sikhism. They are calm, lust, growth, rage, rage or anger, fear and hatred, whatever you want to call it, lobe, which is greed of wealth, power and fame. Calm, growth, lobe, more, more. Next is more, which is attachment, delusion, ignorance, obsession, and the last one is ahankar, which is vanity, pride, ego, or destroyer of our tranquility of our mind. These are the five basic causes of violence leading to suffering in human existence. The self-control of all these Five evils is the key to inner peace and also the core contribution of not just Hinduism, of all the major religions of the world. And inner peace comes from within and is futile to seek it elsewhere. It radiates from within and our behavior will be its manifested, manifestation. What you do outwards to people is a reflection of who you are and what you feel inside. That's it. That's I just that's the inner piece of it. Just following up on what you both this this me now. In the modern world, there isn't an awful lot of time for chanting, meditation. Where sure. I mean, I feel frantic all the time. <clears throat> you know, where do you get the time to worry about your inner transformation, particularly when? You're saying it is the prerequisite, but someone like me, I mean, I'm more busy with like, advocacy on nuclear weapons. The inner transformation is neglected, and that's our society doesn't give a lot of time for it. Any suggestions for us? No, I can start, because I just finished hearing the inner peace. That we are, look, if we were violent, we could not sit in this room and talk to each other. Simple. So, same goes in offices. In London transport, you should go to the tube or the bus or whatever. We go to the petrol station to fill up our car, whatever. We do live in a peaceful society. We do got have those type of people who are not peaceful, but we really live in a in a peaceful society besides the violent bit of it. So, so we just need to increase this peacefulness. I, I understand and I believe because you have got, you get up in the morning, you shave, shower, whatever, you go to work, come back, you play with your children or whatever, watch a bit of television, you are bad. So you have got the time to worry about the world. But I believe if people like me or some of you, most of you here, have, are here because we believe there is more to be done, there's more violence in the world, more wars, there's more chaos, there's more turmoil, and we need to do something. That's why we are, we, but the basic fact is, if you haven't got inner peace, how can you bring world peace? Just, just, just imagine a basic fact of life. I, if I ha I'm not contented in inner peace with myself, I cannot go out and spread the word of peace. Thank you. I, thank you. I'd like to just say about the perception of time and just the experience of uh, fitting in uh, a five-minute silent meditation. But for, for us, it's what fits into our lives in terms of chanting. But the experience is 
in terms of being able to take action on the basis of the energy that creates the most value. It becomes an invaluable part of the daily regime, like brushing your teeth and, <laughs> and having your breakfast. That's something you don't want to miss at the beginning of your day, particularly, and we do it morning and evening as much as can fit in. So I totally recommend reviewing <laughs> what, what are the uh, ingredients of the day and sure. how much time you can save in the long run. So a strong message about developing our inner peace, it is important. Yes, yeah, certainly. Self-care, I would say. Yeah. Right, the second part of this question um, relates to, in our, in our um, holy books, there are elements that are not particularly peaceful. Um, I think in the in the Old Testament, in the Bible, some of the books, it seems to be all about wars, mm. actually. Um, the book of Daniel, I'm not as familiar with my Bible as you are, but, but, but you know, very much about war. And in Islam, too, elements of slavery being acceptable and so on. How do you deal with that when we're talking about the promotion of peace and non-violence? Okay, so um, I think another one I have is Judges 19 and Rosa Tamar. Um, but I would argue that um, the incarnation, so Jesus coming to earth, um, superseded all of that, and that um, we need to read the Old Testament backwards, so we need to read it through the lens of the New Testament, um, which essentially has a message of peace and non-violence, um, and that's what Jesus chose to emphasise in his message. So I think as Christians, that's that's how we deal with it. I know, I'm not an Old Testament scholar, I focus mainly on the New Testament. But um, that would be the kind of the answer I would give as a, uh, the, the first part of the question is that I don't think that we can take any action or be activists without a very strong prayer life. So we just, um, one of the examples we should look to are people like Dorothy Day, Daniel Berrigan um, and his brother Phil, who before they would undertake any plowshare action, or any, any kind of action towards social justice would spend maybe 24 hours in fasting and prayer. Um, and, and that is absolutely vital to give us the strength and the inner calm we need to deal with people who will often be facing us in, in quite a violent way because they disagree with what it is we're trying to promote. Thank you. Mark? Yes. Um, two points. War which a lot of people quote or misquote as jihad in Quran. And the issue of slavery is the about. So when you look at many verses, I think we'll this. <laughs> there is a big difference in the Arabic word of what jihad means and holy war, which is different completely. Because jihad is not holy war. I don't know who decided to translate it that way. Jihad is a struggle. In, in Quran, throughout the Quran, the word jihad is a struggle. The inner struggle, there is an emphasis more actually through many verses on the inner struggle. Spiritual enlightenment, getting better through prayers through the effort, uh, the own effort. Uh, and then the, the jihad that people think it's war is mentioned maybe, I cannot exactly tell you how many times, but very few times in the Quran. Mm. The life of the Prophet, which, uh, be, peace be on him, uh, I'm not here to defend him, but looking through his life, he only conducted war for self-defense. He never attacked people because he wanted to plunder, or he wanted to gain material, uh, wanted power. Uh, there are lots of things that one can bring to illustrate how he was a person who peace was his ultimate goal. He only resorted to war when it was vital for him to defend 
a nation that was in Medina at the time, he had to defend. Uh, and uh, it goes, it's logical, it makes sense to defend yourself. There is no self-defense is, 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 is a right. Uh, for slavery, the Quran states, uh, there is, of course, you will find this word, or istibad in the Quran. But always there is a mention of encouragement to the people to free the slaves. Because it was a social, at the time, it was a social part of the social fabric to have slaves. It would have been very difficult, or it would have, cre have created an imbalance in society, or create what we call in Arabic fitna some problems, if suddenly you have a, a system that is based on slavery, and then the Quran will come and say, oh, it's not slavery. So, so it was, uh, th there, is, there is the element of process was, was taken with process, and it showed because uh, the prophet himself was always encouraging his friends or his companions to free slaves, because he was the illustration of the principle or the spirit of the Quran. And uh, having the word slavery in the Quran doesn't mean that Islam or Quran condone or accept slavery. It was just temporary. Yeah. Thank you very much. Martin, do we have some questions on the chat? <coughs> We were trying to avoid handing round the mics. We thought it's probably not really helpful. It has been clean since the start. Mm. <coughs> I think we don't seem to have any questions in there yet. But if anybody would like to post one, we can definitely. Yes, well, we'll come back to the point. If you notice the question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've always, well,
we cannot condone our people going into this war to kill people because it's against our religion. And they didn't do that. So I wanted to formally remove myself from the church immediately because as a protest. But it's not just the Church of England. It's all Christian religion. How to have, you know, when the, when the pastors go and bless the troops and send them off to war to kill people, that, how can they do that? And how can Jews kill people? And how can Muslims kill people? Because it's against their religion. They have these ten, simple Ten Commandments. So my question is, how can we uh, further that discussion in the, with Muslims, with Jews, with Christians, because that is against their religion to kill people? How can they justify killing people? Absolutely. Can I, can I answer that? Yes, please. Um, please. The, the, there is the politics. Okay, there is the prob there is a major no no there is a major problem where when the politics gets involved it clouds the whole picture. Unfortunately, this is my my belief. Now, what happens in the teaching of Islam, in the mosques, in the madrasas, among Muslims, there is room for improvement, I think. Because some of the imams, and I know them here in Oxford, in many places, I, I, I know quite few. I have to say, I, I'm, not, I'm not the reference <laughs> in Quran, but my understanding of certain verses goes in contradiction to some other people's understanding. I respect their view, but there is a need for among Muslims, among theologians, among uh, f for not a revolution, I wouldn't call it, but a review of some of the understanding, getting away from the superficial or the literal reading. Uh, that, that, that is, that I always advocate this in terms of how to get the <coughs> message across to Muslims. So how, what, what does the Quran say about this? If you pick and choose a verse here, a verse there, you will create disaster. And that is part of what was happening. And let's put it this way, Al-Qaeda or Daesh, or, uh, these are words that we should not shy away of talking because these are real issues. And lots of those people, when they speak, I understand Arabic, I understand what they are saying, but I, I cannot accept that my religion is like this because my understanding of the Quran is completely different from that pick and choose verse or pick and choose or focusing on the literalistic views. And then, and then you will have young people that get completely swayed. And I have to say, there is a problem that needs to be addressed, but also on the other hand, of course, we cannot say everything, but these are the two elements I need to focus on. The efforts from the Muslims to make a uh, uh, step forward in understanding or clarifying or improving the education of the imams and the teachers. On the other hand, the media, whether it is in the Arab world or Islam world or here in the West, I think it needs to open up and try to to be more constructive instead of just pointing the finger all the time, you are, you are doing, you are doing. Just get to a certain balance, have certain balance. I think this, these are the two things, in my opinion, that uh, Muslims may, uh, it may help Muslims forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Me or oh, Rosalie? I, I can say something quickly. Yeah, yeah sure. Does it work? Yeah, perhaps keep that mic down, Martin. Martin, is that my horn? That one, yes. Yeah. Is that one really the um, oh, that one. No, no, it doesn't. Don't use it. Well, yes, I think yes, we yes, have that one's for Zoom, that one's for this room. Oh. Okay. I just wanted to say, um, maybe your question isn't so much directed at the Buddhists, but in the Lotus Sutra, rely on the law, not upon people, is something that I come back to many times. If we are disappointed, maybe by the uh, behavior of people in our own faith, um, 
That is a challenge to us to, to overcome. That's part of the inner peace work, the human revolution. But ultimately, uh, we're all responsible for what we do and our karma. And it's, it's about um, coming back to that realization and being able to be grateful for the adversity, what we can challenge it within ourselves in order to be able to um, deal with whatever confronts us. So that, that's my particular response. Yeah. Uh, I'll just try to take a different view out of it because I want to see the world as it is. Yeah, Before we want to change the world in a way we all like or love to do it in this room. The problems being rich and poor and equality, inequality, etc. There are also root causes of wars. But one of the main root causes of war is, especially after the Second World War, is creating more enemies. Who create enemies? Military industrial complex. Why they do it? Because they want to run the weapon factories. Because they, they want to run the weapon factories 24 hours a day. And if we don't have wars, if we don't have, and it is one of their main uh, guiding or core principle is to keep creating tensions in the world and have wars. These wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, which happened after 9-11, as I said, 21 trillion is the cost of these wars. And just before that, General Butler, who was in the CIA and retired, he says, I was in, I, we were in a meeting and these wars from Afghanistan to Iraq to Syria to Yemen and Libya were earmarked for this year, 2003 for Iraq war, all that. This is not a conspiracy theory, or I'm making it up, you go and see the test testimony of General Butler were created. Why? So that the military industrial co complex can keep on creating weapons and more weapons and more armaments and more... Yeah. They, they actually do not care how many people are killed, how many families are suffering, how many brothers and sisters have lost their their relations like in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, etc. Now, they all care is how much profit they make for their shareholders. So they, unless and until, even one of my friends wrote a book and, said, and he said, why don't we give these five or ten top companies like Lockheed Martin, Honeywell uh, and others, why don't we give them the, their yearly profits, as long as they don't go to different lands and kill people. That was a revolutionary idea my friend gave it to, uh, gave it in, in one of his books, yeah. And which I agree, you don't want to go and kill people. All you want, if you want just profit for your shareholders, you have the profit. The world as as Gandhi has said, they, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. So it is the situation of the greedy corporations of the military industrial complex. Who are, and as Kamal was saying, all these media, media is in their pocket because the rich people own the media. Only four companies own the whole media in the world, the Fox and the CBS and others. Uh, Turner Enterprise and all that. Only four companies, that's all it is. And they non-stop carry on, Muslims are so bad people. <laughs> so much nonsense and so much propaganda against mainly Muslims, but now they've got different target. Russia, China, North Korea. And these, these are the new villains. Because one of my Russian friends said to me that 
if they try blaming everything what happens wrong in the world to the Russians, are we superhuman beings? How can we create all the problems in the world? So this is quite understandable to an ordinary person. It's common sense. How can China and Russia be blamed for the evils we we are creating in the world? So unless and until Lilius, you, coming back to your question, we don't have activism, ground activism. Some some organizations are doing brilliant work, like Movement for Abolition of War, like World Beyond War. Yeah, some others are doing brilliant work to stop wars all over, abolition of war. But unless and everyone, all of us stand up and say, we are not ready to tolerate this anymore and we want to live in a just and peaceful world, it's not going to happen. So we have to start, our work starts now. So I think to come back to your original question, which was um, from what I interpreted a kind of failure of leadership within, um, and I'll, I'll kind of speak to the Christian churches, I think one of the main problems we've got is the translation of that commandment. So it's either thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder. So within Catholicism, it's very strongly thou shalt not kill. But within some sections of Protestantism, it's translated as, thou shalt not murder. And that is used as the justification for going to war. Because apparently when you kill someone in war, it's not murder. Even if, even if it is. Even if it is. Um, Which it absolutely is. Yes, um, thank you um, <laughs> for, for saying that. I, th there are two major problems um, that I see solutions, I, I can see quite simple solutions to. The first is about military chaplains. I have never understood why, I'm just going to speak about my own church because I can't speak about the Protestant churches. I have never understood why, given the teachings of the gospel, given the idea that um, Jesus teaches very clearly, blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus has a, a non-violent approach to life, why our church gives chaplains to the armed forces. Mm. I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I say this as someone who knows chaplains um, who work in the armed forces. I, I, I think as well that in many ways it causes, it causes problems for the, for the soldiers that are Catholic because they should be going into parishes and exper experiencing parish life and experiencing the fullness of, of Catholicism instead of being hived away like there's some kind of embarrassing problem. So that's the first thing we need to do, um, is, is actually have a frank and open conversation about that. Um, and I think the second thing is that, for better or for worse, we are a very divided church in terms of our activism. You're either a justice and peace Catholic or Christian, or a pro-life Catholic and Christian, or you're, a, you're a, a prayer, or you're a Christian meditation person. And I think that the Catholic Bishops' Conference needs to get out that justice is at the heart of absolutely everything we do. Justice is the root of the, the pro-life movement, so the, um, or the anti-abortion movement and it's at the heart of, of the peace movement. And there needs to be some sort of facilitated, facilitated conversation so that we can see that we're actually all working for the same goal, um, which is the, the, the creation of the kingdom, the kind of, um, the realization of, of the incarnation of Christ. And that actually, there needs to be a kind of a grassroots movement towards that mm -hmm. a realization that everything we do if you're a prayer or a, a person that works in a food bank or somebody that works at the highest policy levels you need to understand that at the fundamental heart of everything we do as christians is peace and justice yeah, I mean, can i just tell you a little story about iraq um 
I don't know how many people were here. I'm sure some of you were at the big um, demonstration in Hyde Park, the million strong demonstration. Put up your hand if you were there. Oh, nearly everybody in the room. <laughs> what about you on Zoom? You can put your hand up even though we can't see you. <laughs> so at that march, I mean, not only were we there as individuals, I mean, Christian CND was there, Pax Christie had people there, nearly the whole staff of CAFOD and Christian Aid were there, but they couldn't officially carry any of their banners because our own bishops' conference, none of our bishops were there. I know they might have been hidden away in a million people, but as far as I know, not, none of our bishops went. But just to say, I think that is changing, and our bishops have now... No, they, they knew it wouldn't go down well. I wouldn't say they were stamped on, but they didn't bring in CAFOD banners. But I mean, I don't really want to particularly focus on CAFOD, but that's the example I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the peace groups proudly showed their banners. The development agencies and other Christian groups didn't, even though they were there in force. But as far as I know, none of our bishops went. Um, although they was, you know, they called for peace in a vague kind of way, but not speaking out against the war. And it's this whole thing about being patriotic, that the church wants to be patriotic. And we get this every Remembrance Sunday. So, um, but just to say, I think it has changed. And now, I mean, like we've got two Pax Christi people here. Um, the bishops um, have now spoken out mm -hmm. against nuclear weapons. It was very slow in coming, but it has come now. So I think it's moving, and it's moving on environmental justice too. Catholic, isn't it? That's Catholic, so yes. what about the CFE? Okay. Church of England. Nuclear weapons. I wouldn't I, be 100% sure. No. Um, you can say that. Well, the, the CFE general centre did pass a resolution against nuclear weapons quite recently. Yeah. But, and and that, uh, the Archbishop of York, Stephen Cockrell, major pusher of mm. that and has been very actively involved with CMD over the years. So certainly I think if you at an individual level, I think you'll find very few people that aren't against them. Yeah. It is a matter of it being generalized as kind of being overtly church policy. And then there's the, the divestment something else. aspect. Mm. Like who is investing in these nuclear weapons is another big question. Yeah. But on the peace front, which is more than just nuclear weapons, it's about it's about militarization and as I say, killing people. For me it's it's about killing people. So in my mini manifestation for peace it said uh, uh, the way to peace is if anybody everybody would refuse to push the button or pull the trigger or unsheath the knife. Because I think that's the, those are the main ways of killing people, aren't they? Yeah. Well, that's why many groups now, we do value um, conscientious objectors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every year we go to Tavistock Square, um, yeah. you know, to celebrate conscientious objectors. But anyway, I'm definitely saying too much. Um, because I'm not supposed to be saying anything. I, I, I want to go back very quickly to what Carmel said. He said about how Muhammad conducted war in self-defense and, and that self-defense is all right. Because I, I remember in a Christian tradition somewhere where the, these guys went into the den of lions knowing that they were going to be eaten and they didn't fight the lions. They, 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 they weren't supposed to fight. They were supposed to turn the other cheek. And that was the Christian teaching at that time. And that was Old Testament, wasn't it? I can't
No, you raise very important questions. Yeah. I would raise them myself. I mean, every Remembrance Sunday. Yes. I put a criticism, I, well, I put down a suggestion about using a white poppy on my Facebook rather than a red one. Well, I've had a load of hate mail over it. Really? Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah I was quite proud, really, well, actually. The thing is that when they say uh, they gave their lives for us, uh, this year I went uh, to the, the uh, memorial in Littlehampton where I live and said, well, actually, they didn't give their lives. Their lives were taken from them because they were conscripted and it was against the law not to go to war. So they didn't give their lives. Their lives were taken away. But that is a really inflammatory statement. So, you know, you've got to think. And we were just talking about threats from uh, people who are against peace movements, military people who don't, don't, who don't, who are, uh, we had a bomb threat at a whole university and that was for the, the Mm -hmm. it, it raises hackles as it does. Thank you. Uh, Maria, do you uh, want to come back? So, um, just, just a couple of things. Conscription didn't come in until 1917, and um, the Irish certainly weren't conscript conscripted, but they were, as Alan said, they were sold a line about patriotism. Um, you know, dulce et decorum est pro patrio mori and all that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'll say is turning the other cheek is actually a very radical act of nonviolence, because by doing that, you're making the person hit you with their left hand. So if you just kind of look at Walter Wink on nonviolence, that in itself is a form of self-defense and standing up because you're saying, um, I am deserving of more. And that comes to the, the kind of inner tranquility and inner strength I, I was talking about when I was talking about prayer. And um, I'll just move on yes. to Kamala. Th th thank you. You raised the point or question that obviously within the Christian or even within the Islamic. Uh, yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, when we talk about defending oneself, I think here is very important to remember that when you defend yourself, you are making a statement that justice, I have the right to live. You don't have the right to oppress me. This is, this, is the, this is the departure point, or this is maybe the understanding of the Islamic perspective on when you defend yourself, but don't start, don't aggress. Don't go and start problems. Somebody comes to my house, wants to kill me, I think it is natural to defend oneself. And maybe that's, maybe you misunderstood me when I said the prophet was conducting a war of defense because if one goes into the details of what happened, according to the sources we have, the, without going into too much details as well, the, the Quraysh, the people who were in Mecca, were, were, were actually the central city of Arabia. They had so much power. They wanted to annihilate the the whole uh, newly uh, uh, nation or uh, Islamic nation then. And he had to, to resort to defend himself, but he never started it. So that is very important because uh, I hear a lot or I sometimes read in the, the media or people who also, some orientalists who write about Islam, that the Prophet of Islam was conducting a war. If you leave it like that as an open, of course, uh, one has to make a distinction. What kind of, uh, how did he, how did he uh, do that aiming to prevent war, actually. No, it's not, it's not, he wasn't doing war to, to start a war or to kill people. He wanted peace. And in fact, when he conquered Mecca, he had the people who used to, uh, Quraysh, he, he had them in his hands. He could have killed them because that was the norm in Arabia at the time. And he forgave them. That for him, that for us, or the way I look at it, was the best illustration of someone who wanted peace, but he needed to preserve uh, a certain balance, or he 
needed to defend himself. That's how, that's my answer for possibly a misunderstanding sometimes. Possibly. Thank you, Kamal. PJ? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, it could be here hours uh, on the self-defense and just war theory. Yeah. Because I, the least, on the least I can say is they're very controversial. Yeah. So I could be, I could be arguing that they're both wrong, but it will take me so much time to do it. But I want to concentrate. The war is here. Yeah. And we are in. Uh, worldwide tensions, and we are we are here. If the things don't go wrong, if if the things do go wrong, we could be entering into a major war, or even a world war three, as the tensions are because China is encircled with about eight hundred of U.S. ships. China is encircled. Chinese have sent a very strong fleet to Alaska. That if the U.S. did something mischievous or wrong. They could f fire all the cities in the U.S. from Alaska, their naval boat. So this is the reality we are living in. So we have to face this reality. So my my uh, take on this will be that maybe it might take one year, hundred year, fifty year, we have to do things like peace education. Yeah, that's a great thing. We want to educate people what's going on in the real world and how to have peace education. Divestment, which Lily, as you said, divestment of weapons like swords into plowshares. Yeah, and abolition of war. There are so many ways to abolish war. One of my world beyond war. What they did was they put billboards all over the United States. Because a generous donor give the, give money, saying three percent of U.S. military. So some of my questions is some some of those I took it from there. So my question, 3% of U.S. military could prevent or finish hunger all over the world, things like that. So they are doing great work. So And also, people need to read my book. It's not just a, <laughs> that I have written the book. I, anybody else could have written the book. Because it says how not to go to war. Yeah? It's like a self-help book. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> So how to stay healthy, things like that. Because one of the one of the reviewers who reviewed it in USA, it has sold more in USA than in, in Europe, actually, my book, said that somebody could think, a military person could go into Noble and Barnes, which is the biggest bookshop book in the world in USA, and buy this book on pretext how he can go against it and have one. So he done a good good review that because I have outlined how wars are created and how we can get rid of them. And one of the ideas came from there, from my research, was Ministry or Department for Peace. That if we have all the countries of the world a Department for Peace and disarmament, then there is a chance, whatever chance it is that we can go into that road where the culture of peace starts, culture of non-violence starts, culture of cooperation, harmony, tolerance, and all these areas which all of us in different religions work, can create finally a peaceful world which we all are trying very hard to do. Thank you so much. Ross, can you be very quick? Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to put in um, a plug there for dialogue. Thank you for organising the dialogue we're having because I think that is uh, an essential question that's come up. Um, but I'm also extremely aware that um, the military uh, contributes a huge amount to um, climate crisis. 
that we cannot afford as a human race to have war anymore. Um, and one of the key issues for people who join the military is economic, I would suggest. I want to back up what Vijay's been saying, because um, that is the paradigm shift I think we're in. I think we need to realize what this, the kind of choices that the, the people with lower social economic status, maybe they are completely targeted by the military. And, and the issue that was brought up there was the fact that um, I can plug the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom created an exhibition. It's online on climate justice. And one of the key points was about the military's contribution to the climate crisis. And it was in a, it was, I think, in um, somewhere down south near uh, where the military are extremely popular in the local population. One of the um, panels was apparently found in the bin. That's what we were talking about. But that is an issue for dialogue, and that is an issue to explore further, I suggest. Thank you. It's scandalous that in the COP final agreement, and even in the Paris agreement, the, the emissions of the military and aviation were, were not yeah, included. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll yeah. follow up on that one. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, um, all of you, to our distinguished panel. I've, I've learned an awful lot today from all of you, and you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Ready to go? Um, welcome, everyone, to our final session. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Steve Hoxby. I'm policy advisor working with the churches. I work with the Methodist Church, the United Reformed Church, and the Baptist Union of um, Great Britain. Working in the Joint Public Issues team, my role is to um, help our churches and members of churches think through, through um, a number of issues of public life, um, and my particular area that I focus on is around international affairs, um, war, peace, human rights, and many of the topics that we've been discussing today. Um, helping also our church leaders um, speak out to um, and to liaise with Parliament uh, in these matters, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The purpose of this session, though, is to have a little bit of opportunity for us to say um, from what we've heard earlier today, um, what actions might we be taking forward? How do we see the world at the moment? What do we see as the priorities over the next year? Um, and I'm going to invite um, all of you to think about one action that you think that we might be taking, uh, that we might want to take over the next year. Um, I've asked Martin if he can put a question into the chat. Um, and the question that I want to pose for us is, how can we work better across states to bring about learning and change? How can we work better across states to bring about learning and change? We've had some really useful um, contributions from each of the faith perspectives today and how it is that people of different faiths come to the um, topic of uh, building peace, um, of promoting um, peaceful responses, non-violent responses uh, to conflict and to resolution of um, problem, problems in, in our world. So how would, do we then actually bring those individual faith responses um, together in order to better work together? Um, I'm going to start off just by um, talking a little bit um, about some of the work of the churches. I hope this might give some encouragement and uh, inspiration. First of all, I'm going to start off with it, um, uh, something which may be slightly more challenging, and that's picking up on the discussion in the last session, which is around about chaplains and um, military chaplains. Um, and I'm really keen that the churches are um, forthright in that they are um, support for peace and non-violence. Um, I'm just going to put it out there, though, that um, as fundamentally the chaplains in our churches, their role is um, to support women and men in our military in terms of pastoral support, spiritual support. For some chaplains, that's their own role. Um, and my, my suggestion is that um, um, women and men working in our armed forces, whatever you think of the armed forces, are just as deserving, I think, of spiritual support as any 
any other um, member of the um, population. And I think that if you are serving in a, um, uh, the stress of a war environment, possibly you're even more in need of uh, that support for spiritual um, reflection uh, than, than the rest of us. Now, the big question that then um, poses, I think, is does that place our churches in a position of some sort of compromise? Um, and that's a question I think that we can legitimately debate. Um, uh, but I put out there that, that essential role of uh, chaplains, which is one of pastoral support. Let me, um, I, I want to switch to words of encouragement. And my perspective is working from within the churches. But in the churches, when we work on issues of um, peace and justice, um, we work, of course, across with other faith partners, and we work with partners of no faith. And I am inspired personally to be involved in, in this work because, <coughs> partly because I believe that the UK um, still has influence uh, in our world, and influence which it should work to use, influence which it fails to use too often. And I think it needs all of us to speak up and to chippy our elected representatives, um, our, our media, to um, encourage uh, the, the government to do, to do better. I just want to recall just briefly a few instances over the last few years which has really encouraged and inspired me. Um, and in some cases I've had the privilege to be uh, involved in some of these. I'm going to go back to 2008 and the Cluster Munitions Convention. Um, uh, Article 36, the, that, that group in the UK, would, would help substantially with the coordinating of the campaign around cluster munitions. In the churches, we also supported with briefings to our parliamentary contacts. Um, and you may recall the role the UK government played in the final conference in Dublin in 2008. The United States had been lobbying countries to exclude from the ban some forms of what they called smart cluster munitions, uh, where supposedly the bomb list often, um, always did explode. Um, uh, and, but, but we knew that those bomb lists still, they, they, those plus smart munitions still posed a problem of unexploded bomb lists, which would then impact communities which would continue to kill children long after the, um, a war had ended. And it was, the, it was the UK that made the difference there. It was Gordon Brown, Brown who dramatically discovered the US lobbying position on so-called smart munitions by announcing during the treaty that was composing that last, uh, the, the final text of that treaty, um, he announced the dismantling of the UK's remaining two smart um, cluster munitions um, during that conference and then supported a much more robust form of the treaty. Why did he do that? I think he did that because he had got the message from civil society in the UK, from a group of campaigning groups, as to what an effective treaty text would look like and what failure would look like, and that message got through. The arms trade treaty. Um, the arms trade treaty was had great um, civil society support. It had the support of um, UK branches of uh, Amnesty International, of Oxfam, of safer world. <coughs> Again, the UK influence was significant here. In the UK, the UK became the first major power to pledge support for the arms trade treaty in 2005. That was Jack Straw, you might recall, um, pledged that support. Um, uh, and it was a result of the UK's pledge to work towards a new treaty that finally a process started in 2007 um, and the arms trade treaty came into being and was signed um, in 2013 and entered into force in 2014. So that space of time, nine years from 2005 to 2014, again, because there was a really strong civil society and movement in the UK that was calling for this um, treaty, which then eventually became a global treaty. Around that sort of time, um, we had problems um, in Syria with the Syrian war. Um, following a chemical 
chemical weapons attack on the outskirts of Damascus gave David Cameron's sort for the UK to intervene militarily in Syria. He brought a vote to Parliament, a vote which he and others were quite confident that the government would carry. But there was a huge um, move um, uh, against that. Eventually, 30 Conservative MPs and 9 Lib Dems MPs voted against the government's desire to intervene in Syria. David Cameron lost the vote, therefore, 288 to 272. Some people have said that this is the first time since the Crimean War in 1855 that the House of Commons has voted against a government call for military intervention. From our part, um, a statement and briefing from our church leaders um, from the Baptists, Methodists, and United Reformed Churches that was issued in the couple of months prior to that Parliament vote um, was, the, was the most accessed resource that we had produced um, that, that year. Um, there was tremendous interest, I think, in the faith contribution into the, what was then um, a public debate at that time. UK's influence? Well, the day after the Commons vote, President Obama, who was expected to any day to authorise direct US intervention in Syria, instead went to his advisers and said that he wanted to seek the um, permission of Congress, which was, of course, um, surprised a lot of people, and, and Congress's blessing did not um, come at that stage. Um, so the UK's influence clearly has um, uh, an influence elsewhere. And then finally, I'm going to come to um, uh, something which is dear to my heart, and I know to, to many of your, you as well, and that is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the progress that we are making uh, in that, that field. Um, ICANN has been really significant across the world in helping to galvanise civil society support. Meanwhile, non-nuclear weapon states um, across the world have supported also the process of intergovernmental conferences, which eventually led to the drafting of the treaty text of the Treaty on no Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. We're at the situation now where the nuclear weapons states have rejected the treaty. They've got no intention of signing up to the um, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons for the foreseeable future. However, so other states may do, and the treaty will have an impact anyway. Um, it will have an impact in the private sector, and here I've got some good news for you which you may, may or may not have heard, and that is Serco, that one of our largest companies um, used to have one third stake in AWE Aldermaston before AWE was renationalised by the UK government earlier this year. Um, it's been reported that Serco has declined a bid to um, uh, manage, do the facilities management for AWE um, uh, ongoing, um, a role which is provided in the past. Um, the report states that the reason for Serco's concerns is investors' concerns um, from their ESG policies um, concerns that investors are disinvesting from nuclear weapons companies and this has led Serco to get wet feet over continuing involvement in AWE Aldermaston. Assuming that that is the, the, the case and this progresses, um, that contract is going to be more difficult for the government to fulfil in the future and more expensive. I think I've seen reports suggest that there's only one other company that would be in the frame. Um, so this is as a direct response of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons because companies now have to understand that they're involved <coughs> in these sorts of tra um, contracts, they're involved in activities that are contrary to international law. And that's not a position that any com company is particularly um, uh, excited um, uh, to be in. Uh, 
as, as face, we've been working on um, uh, banks, pensions, uh, and nuclear weapons. <coughs> and so the UK end of, if you like, the don't, global Don't Bank on the Bomb um, is supported by Don't Bank on the Bomb Scotland um, and also by the uh, Nuclear Weapons Finance and Research Group. Uh, which has been established as a cross-faith uh, <coughs> initiative in the UK. And if there's one action that I would urge you to take um, over the coming year, that is to uh, get letters out to banks and pension companies that you may have um, relations with. Uh, happily for you, those letters are already written. And you can go to the website on www.investingforchange, or no, investinginchange, I think it is, dot UK, uh, and then So there's just a few um, areas which I thought I wanted to put out there because they are ex um, examples of where faith, people of faith have come together, they've coordinated together um, cross faith, they've coordinated with other civil groups um, uh, uh, outside of the faith community and they've brought about change. And one of the things that excites me is that if we can um, get a, a larger mobilization together, we can begin to all um, influence the politics um, and make some changes in our world. So with that little bit of encouragement I come back to our question and that is how can we better work together across faiths to bring about learning and change. Um, <coughs> and I invite people who are online um, to put uh, any, either, either your suggestions on that or your questions to others on that and we have with us um, here BJ and Roslyn, um, who from uh, uh, who, who will contribute to this. If you've got any spe specific questions for them, for, for them, then we'll seek their um, uh, support and help uh, in these questions as well. So I wonder if there's one thing that you feel that looking over the next year or two, if there's one thing that you feel you would like to put out there for us, um, a one action that would be particularly helpful for us across faiths to um, uh, bring about learning and change. I'll come to the floor first and then I'll come to, um, secondly, I'll ask Martin to um, bring us questions from the chat online if there are any. <coughs> yeah, do you want to say your name? My name is Sally Reynolds. I'm um, a Quaker living nearby, but also secretary of the movement for the abolition of war. And to me, the one most important thing this year has to be the environment. Not just climate change, but, but all the other you know, pollution and, and loss of species. <coughs> I would, I've just watched a film called Living in the Time of Dying. I don't know if anyone else has watched it. It's been made by people with Buddhist, um, you know, leanings, if you like. And um, I think everyone should watch it because it's, it's, is about how we use our faith to adapt to the almost certain destruction of the world as we know it. And it's a tough watch, but, but um, and I think we are going to need all our faiths and all, all the, the resources that our religions give us to, to face this and to face it squarely. Thank you. And just say the name again of that um, resource. Living in a time of dying. It's freely available on, on YouTube. Living in a time of dying. Thank yeah. you. Martin, do we have any questions from the um, from Zoom? Uh, could the word time mention be posted in the chat, please? Yeah. I haven't got any questions yet. Sorry? I haven't got any actual questions yet, apart from that. Okay. Um, other questions or comments from the floor? Yep. Um, where we go from here, uh, from today, in, um, in campaigning, I think uh, the answer to that could be that when we leave today, a 
two-pronged approach we could have. One would be to with our own uh, places of worship mm-hmm. uh, to order in this meeting, and but mainly to listen to their responses. Listening is very important, and it, it shows respect for people, and you get to know them better because they accept you more if you listen to them. Uh, the other prong is to look up and research where the other meetings take place, other uh, other religions uh, find out where what the Jews are doing um, uh, on the internet and what the Buddhists are doing and what the um, all the different religions and um, actually find out perhaps you can't go to them but actually you can join them in if you find out where the, where their next Zoom meetings are and again be uh, listening carefully to what they say in order to be accepted and then you can give a report on this meeting <coughs> yeah because I think too often we are talking with each other um, within like-minded groups mm. um, and if we're going to be um, challenging mm. others and offer them ideas we need to be listening um, at the same time thank you for that um, yeah any letter if you want to uh, sorry first introduce yourself earlier to the Labour Party's um, uh, 
the shadow department of Peace, Peace and Disarmament, David yeah. Hamilton, and his work. Let's not get too party political no. um, here. <laughs> um, uh, no. But but what what more do you feel that um, uh, in the UK our politicians ought to be doing to further the role of um, uh, mm. thinking around uh, disarmament and mm. peace? Well, well, to start with, UK is a great power. Like US say, we are only five members of the Security Council, P5s, and the UK is one of them. So, if we want to, we can play a major role. And we got great influence with the USA and all the major powers. As you can see, although it didn't much achieve in the COP, but we still have the influence. So the great, the, the problem starts with all these security members, uh, security council members in the United Nations are not great powers, but they are also great suppliers of armaments and they cling to the, the, the threat of using or threatening to use nuclear weapons. And, and they, they do not budge from there. And they have a tendency of culture of war and continuing profit from the sale of armaments. So until and unless we stop that, we cannot go to the next hurdle. Coming to UK, no, we, we need to appreciate what happened when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader. And me and him been working very closely in the CND long time ago. Uh, and uh, we convinced him that we need to have it, a, a minister. Actually, we wanted a ministry, but he opted for a minister for peace and disarmament, which is great news. And also, it's a great news that after our lobbying care stronger, the present leader, he has kept this post, mm -hmm. which is a good news. <clears throat> now, I am actually, not because I was coming here, it was scheduled about six weeks ago in my diary that I'm going to go and see him in the parliament, uh, having tea and cakes with him <laughs> next week. And uh, we are going to discuss further on this issue of what you just said, of peace and disarmament, how we as a whole, as a civil society, can help him to once, which is about certain, I would say, all the follies and mistakes the present government every day we hear are making. Labour is going to be in power in two or three years' time, and let's hope it is. So, what type of agenda a peace of and disarmament minister should be? Because remember, he's at the cabinet level, so he can influence decisions. So if the defense minister, or what we used to call war minister in the old times, sets up, gets up and say, ah, there is a tension in that part of the world, and we need 50 tanks, 20 planes, and that many weapons, so we can crush this, uh, uh, this incursion or whatever. Then he should be on the table to say, hang on, we haven't, we haven't exhausted all the, uh, uh, all the avenues like dialogue, diplomacy, you know, avenue of going to United Nations and taking their permission for war, or we haven't had a vote in the parliament. So he can convince the Minister of Defense that it's not business as usual. Whereas uh, one of our vice presidents who recently died, uh, Lord Frank Judd, he was United for Peace Vice President and he used to be on the cabinet ta table because before he took up as director of Oxfam he was uh, a Minister of International Development and before that he was actually a war minister and then he became a peace activist and he said to me categorically in one of our meetings that Vijay we never discuss peace or dialogue in the cabinet meetings. We only discuss how many military personnel we need, how many tanks we need, how many planes we need to go to war. So that kind of a situation we are having. 
So I think this is very heartening and good news. The the problem is not that when K. Starmer going to be in power, that there will not be a minister for peace and disarmament. Problem lies here. He need to have a full cabinet being a full cabinet minister. Because otherwise, if they put a small little desk like this one in Foreign and Commonwealth Office and forget about him, okay, you know, we have a peace and disarmament minister. And he's, he's, you go through this corridor and that corridor and there and then his small table is right at the back. We don't want that. We want him the full-fledged minister like Minister of Defense, who every year UK spends 60 billion on war. And we are not even in a world war. Where does this 60? And the tragedy is we don't stand up and it's routinely the budget is passed every year. And even in the US, USA is even worse because it's mandatory. Half of the budget in USA, housing, education, jobs, healthcare, they cannot touch it. Half of it already goes to military, which is 732 billion last year. So that kind of a circle, vicious circle we are in, and that kind of a circle we have to bust. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but the, this minister has to have real teeth and power, not a toothless tiger. And a budget behind it. And a budget behind it. Yeah. And a ministry. And a ministry. And a ministry. Now, in your book, <coughs> <Jay>. <laughs> I can't quote it word for word, but... Um, Be sure. Is that right? I can't remember. In your book, how to go, not to go to war. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was an attempt in the 60s. Yeah. So go tell Keir Starmer that and <laughs> say, look, you know, the real Labour Party, the proper Labour Party, because this is one thing. I'm a member of the Green Party, and I went to Labour Party conference this year with Vijay, mm -hmm. and we shared our story with Labour Action for Peace. Sure. So I think yes, we need a Green Party Action for Peace. Sure. We need a conservative action for peace. We need a Lib Dem action for peace. Mm. Because I'm sure there are people in every party yep. who would like peace. Of course. So we need to get that sorted out and, and, and then maybe ask for a Ministry of Peace because then we have more support for it. But we need more support for the Ministry of Defence so you can go to Kyrgyzstan and say, well, did you realise that the Green Party action for peace and the Labour mm. action for peace and the Lib Dem action for peace and the Conservative Sure, sure, sure. Great, so I think we've got an action then um, for everyone. Let's write to our uh, MPs, whatever the party they are in, and ask their party to establish a um, either a shadow ministry for um, uh, peace um, in order to, um, but or, or otherwise, sort of official yeah, a, a, a strategy for conflict transformation, for conflict mediation, um, and for investment in peace building. And, um, Hi, what's then? I'm going to come to you. Do you have a, um, uh, an action you would like to recommend for us? Definitely, and I would just like to segue uh, with uh, VJ's meeting with Fabian Hamilton next week. Um, because as I was in Glasgow last week, one of the most exciting developments was really watching the enthusiasm for an international law against ecocide. And I was at an event which was Faith for Ecocide, so I believe you all should be hearing about this very soon. Um, the fact is that to destroy the environment is a crime. It needs to be made so at the International Criminal Court. And I was present when um, David Lammy, actually, as um, Shadow Justice Minister, declared that the Labour Party are on board for an international law against ecocide. And this is absolutely crucial that we understand that to have a peaceful world, everyone has a human right to life, to a healthy environment, that the crises that we're in overlap, that the solutions have to be global, we're all interconnected, and the faith leaders are taking the lead very much um, on all fronts, supporting the Treaty to Privet Nuclear Weapons, which um, 
is a tool really like, um, that is a, in a similar way, I knew Polly Higgins, who was the barrister, unfortunately died two years ago, but she was, uh, yeah, I believe she's still at work in my own faith, um, because she is really connecting people across the world in a very dynamic way to understand it is the fifth crime against peace to be destroying the environment, and it's what's potentially bringing us all together in an accelerated way, in greater solidarity, in fact, to, to recognise that. So I would urge you to, to bring that to the attention of Fabian Hamilton, because I think um, that the peace issue and the climate justice issue have to be seen as one and the same. We heard so much about justice and how peace has to have justice behind it. And the Global South are have every reason to be to be frightened, to be angry, and yet we had the most wonderful display of um, beautiful leadership from indigenous leaders in Glasgow, particularly at the event to support Stop Ecocide, because Ecocide law would actually protect them, and they are protecting us by being on the front line, mm. protecting the Amazon, the forests, and the Pacific, people of the Pacific, you know, the oceans there, are rising to an extent where it's life or death for them. We had some very moving speeches. So this has to be acknowledged, and there has to be, I mean, there's the movement for loss and damage, I know, with Make Cock Count, which is an interfaith thing I'm hearing about. I think faith for ecocide um, has a strong role to play. Um, the, the Pope, all sorts of leaders, have, have made this point because uh, about 200 um, died last year, murdered on the front lines of indigenous people. And we need international law. And this, in a similar way as the Treaty of Private Nuclear Weapons, um, is part, I believe, of this whole paradigm shift of what we accept and what we don't accept. So it has to be understood that, you know, we can't possibly coexist with nuclear weapons in the world and the climate crisis and nuclear power. These things are all threatening to our futures and future generations. So bringing the youth in is really important as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's all a, a sort of uh, plea to talk about ecocide, what it is, and understand that that is um, a potential crime. So faith, faith against ecocide. Um, faith, uh, faith for ecocide law. Faith for ecocide law. Um, and it's appropriate, I think, that we end with um, this reference to, to climate um, and environment, having just had COP26. Uh, I think for many of us um, who were at COP26, we know our hopes was that um, that would come with some very concrete outcomes. The most concrete outcomes that have come from it, in my view, I think, are as to how we now take the agenda forward with much greater urgency, not waiting for another five years for a major COP, but actually um, concluding some really important decisions at COP27 in Egypt next year. And so all of a sudden there's an awful lot more work to do um, over this coming year. Um, uh, hope, um, faith for, for um, make COP count, as um, Rosalind has mentioned, is an interfaith collaboration that has been bringing faiths together and also working with the UK government um, in its liaison with, in, with faiths around the COP26 presidency. So that, I hope, might go forward in some form, um, look at make COP count, um, and do be involved in this agenda over the next year, and also um, in the other areas around peace building that we've spoken uh, about already today. That brings us to the end of the day. Um, I think I probably hand back to um, Pat or Martin um, for concluding words or prayer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you.
being written originally by Satish Kumar oh. and Mother Teresa. So it was an interfaith um, action to begin. And Michael said, you know, a lot of interfaith worship will engage more of our population. And we don't get changes in policy until we get grassroots movement. So if you would like to turn to your little leaflets, we will say that. Thank you. We will say that together.